two speakers to the stage, uh, Dr. Peter Fallon and Tom McNamara. Come on up. Rarum Novarum 
warned us in words remarkable for their 21st century familiarity that, quote, working men have been surrendered, isolated, and helpless to the hard-heartedness of employers and the greed of unchecked competition. The mischief has been increased by rapacious usury, which, although more than once condemned by the church, is nevertheless under a different guise, but with like injustice, still practiced by covetous and grasping men. This is still Pope Leo. To this must be added that the hiring of labor and the conduct of trade are concentrated in the hands of comparatively few, so that a small number of very rich men have been able to lay upon the teeming masses of the laboring poor a yoke little better than that of slavery itself. This is not Karl Marx speaking. In 1891, the problems with capitalism were already apparent to the church. Greed on the part of the owners and controllers of the means of production. Unjust working and living conditions for workers. But this was before the age of widespread electronic media, before the age of a greater awareness of the world, uh, even on the part of the Holy Father, before the age of awareness of the ecological nature of human relationships. By the middle of the 20th century, however, a new age had arisen, and the church was paying attention. In 1961, Pope John XXIII wrote in his encyclical Mater et Magistra that human labor must not be regarded merely as a commodity, but as a distinctly human activity, deserving of respect for its intrinsic dignity. As a result of this inherent human dignity, and because for many, quote, Man's work is his sole means of livelihood. Its remuneration, and again this is a quote, cannot be made to depend on the state of the market. It must be determined by the laws of justice and equity. Private, a private ownership of property, the Holy Father told us, was a natural right, inalienable by any political power. But, he explained, and this is a quote, it naturally entails a social obligation as well. It is a right which must be exercised not only for one's own personal benefit, but also for the benefit of others. In his 1967 encyclical, Populorum Progressio, Pope Paul VI warned us flatly that, quote, no one may appropriate, appropriate surplus goods solely for his own private use when others lack the bare necessities of life. The right of private property may never be exercised to the detriment of the common good. But one of the most stunning statements I've heard from my church came in 1987 in Pope John Paul II's encyclical Solicitudo Rei Socialis, also known as On Social Matters. On social matters is a brilliant critique of global, global economics at the end of the 20th century, at the cusp of the so-called New World Order that would make itself known to the world in a few short years. It is a courageous stand for and defense of Christian principles in the face of both Soviet collectivism and unregulated expansionist laissez-faire capitalism. John Paul looked at the history of human development in the 20th century, and particularly of the post-war period, and found that the proliferation of injustice and poverty had been just as common, if not more so, than the proliferation of equality and prosperity. He denounced the automatic, that is to say unregulated, functioning of economic policies that benefited the wealthy investor over the laborer sliding day by day ever more deeply into poverty. He denounced the failure or refusal of developed countries to forgive the debt of developing countries, most of whom had entailed this debt in the first place during the arduous process of removing themselves from the, low, from the yoke of colonialism uh, by the developed countries of the West. And he denounced, although I'd be willing to bet my last dollar, that there is no one in this audience this evening who is even aware of this because of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, exercise of power of our mainstream media. That unregulated, global, laissez-faire, free market cap capitalism was morally equivalent to communism.
in the structures of sin with, uh, with which each presents the worker. Now, communism is dead, and rightly so. For among its other sins, it denied the essential dignity and liberty of the human soul. But something we're still rightly or wrongly, wrongly calling capitalism lives on, and it is instructive to read John Paul's descriptions of the various structures of sin that capitalism, unregulated by reason or goodwill, presents to us. And I'll list just a few. One, the all-consuming desire for profit. Two, these are, by the way, these are John Paul's words. Two, the thirst for power with the intention of imposing one's will upon others. Three, idolatry of money, ideology, class, and technology. Four, the abuse of resources as though they were inexhaustible. And five, the amassing of resources by the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Now, I spent several minutes uh, up until now making reference to uh, papal encyclicals, and you kind folks in the audience may be thinking at this moment, what in the world does this have to do with a movement made up of dirty, unwashed, drug-crazed, oversexed, hippie anarchists? <laughs> well, if you phrased your question in that way, there's nothing I can say, probably, to persuade you that the Occupy movement has anything to do with Catholic social teaching. But I still have a few minutes left. Might use the line. And I'm going to try to explain my point. First, I call your attention to several works of the late French sociologist, media critic, and Christian theologian uh, Jacques Ellul, especially his three works, The Technological Society, Propaganda, and The Presence of the Kingdom. The Technological Society, Ellul tells us, is predicated on a number of values that supersede all other values. Efficiency, productivity, profit, speed, convenience, and consumption, among others. These values express themselves in myth, social narratives that rationalize our attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. To seek efficiency, even better to achieve efficiency, comes to be seen as an objective good in and of itself. To be productive is an objective good. To make a profit, to provide convenience, to consume, all these things constitute the cultural values of the technological society. They are assimilated into the culture of technologically developed countries and assimilated by the individuals within those countries at an early age. They suffuse our information environment and become self-fulfilling and self uh, sustaining prophecies. Our advertisements, but also our news, our sports, our entertainment programming, and even our educational systems are constant reinforcements of the values of the technological society. This total propaganda, to use Bill Lowell's words, makes use of all the available media of communication at all times and creates a closed system of information that is not only inescapable, but which we, its targets, actually come to crave. Material consumption becomes the raison d'etre of technological men and women, and when we are brutally attacked by evildoers, we don't blink an eye when our president urges us to show the terrorists that they have not won by going shopping. The values of technology, as I said, become self-justifying and self-fulfilling, and human culture takes on, under the influence of highly developed technology, a characteristic that never existed before the 20th century, the loss of human ends. With the pro proliferation of technological means, human beings have lost all sight of the end of human action. To what end do we act in our lives? Elul tells us that we no longer see the satisfaction of human needs as the end of human action. We do send things simply because our technologies make them possible. We consume things simply because we can. We use things simply because they're there. To what end was the iPad created? Ah, wait, 
if we like that too much. Better question. To what end was Jersey Shore created? <laughs> our lives are increasingly mediated and our attentions uh, are increasingly, increasingly focused on ourselves and that's the way we want it. The dramatic characteristic of this age, a little tells us, is that we no longer grasp anything but shadows. We believe in these shadows, we live in them, and we die for them. Reality disappears, the reality of man for himself, and the reality of facts which surround us. But a law also tells us that there are certain objective conditions for the existence of total propaganda. And the loss of one or more of these conditions weaken, uh, weakens the overall effectiveness of propaganda. These conditions include the enjoyment of a general prosperity, the enjoyment of a general level of education, and a shared vision of reality based on shared information. It's ironic, then, that the last 30 years of unregulated capitalism have occurred coincidentally in a time of growing poverty, a falling standard of living, a failure to e of education to create a common culture imbued with common knowledge, and an increasingly polarized marketplace of ideas. To put it simply, the Occupy movement became inevitable as soon as enough people stopped believing that we were benefiting by the technological society and its values, efficiency, productivity, profit, speed, convenience, and consumption. For some people, that was a long time ago. Right now, we should be alarmed not at this movement, but at what it actually represents, the large-scale and widespread failure of the game of capitalism by the rules we are now playing. And that's the problem. So how can capitalism possibly be its own solution? Uh, and now I'm going to be even worse to Tom. I'm going to tell him the answer. <laughs> the answer is quite simple. Once we reject the ideology of the technological society and actually go back to some fundamental sources, Adam Smith, the Enlightenment social philosophers, non-ideological economists, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church. Capitalism needs some new rules. Or, in fact, more accurately, we need to go back to playing the game of capitalism by older rules. We need to reclaim human ends in capitalism. Profit is good, but profit can't be the end of a just economic system. A just economic system serves human needs. Globalization, the organized spread of capitalism through direct foreign investment uh, via the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, has resulted in an increase in wealth around the world, and that is a fact. But less publicized is the fact that it has also resulted in an increase in poverty and a growing income gap globally and within nations between the richest and the poorest. In both numbers and percentages, poverty has, has continued to grow globally in the last 40 years. It's been growing in the United States since the 1980s. We need regulation. As Paul VI told us as far back as 1967, when private, this is a quote, when private gain and basic community needs conflict with one another, it is for the public authorities to seek a solution to these questions with the active involvement of individual citizens and social groups. The recent report of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace noted that our uh, current economic crisis was created in no small part by an economic liberalism that spurns rules and controls. Whose conception of economic liberalism is referred to in this report? Well, certainly free market economists, CEOs, boards of directors and their stockholders, and to the extent that we accept the idea that corporations are persons, we have to include corporations among this group.
but it is also our conception of what constitutes capitalism. And I would like to suggest that we Catholics have to get over it. As the Pontifical Council advises, what is needed is a spirit of solidarity among all constituent parts of the economy that transcends personal utility for the good of the community. To borrow Jacques Lowe's terms, we have found that all the things that our culture has sold us over the last several decades as being new and revolutionary were actually rather tired, recycled ideas that failed even in the past, even if they provided some few people with power and wealth. What we knew, what we need, Elul said, removing his sociologist's hat and putting on the theologians, is a revolutionary Christianity which rejects ideologies of either left or right, which is nonpartisan even as it is profoundly political, and which is based not on institutional principles but on the gospel message. Love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and your whole body, and love your neighbor as yourself. To this end, we need to reclaim the satisfaction of human needs as the end of all human activity, rebuild distinctly human interpersonal relationships, rediscover our own human power and sovereignty as opposed to the illusions of power and sovereignty provided by technologies and material consumables, and regain faith in the idea of the common good. If we can do this, we will be more in conformity with Catholic social justice teaching. And, perhaps to our surprise, or even our shock, we may find ourselves in conformity with much of the message of Occupy Wall Street.